Shalom. It is a delight to be here today with Dr. Dara Horn, a prominent writer, thinker, and um, recently author of People of Dead Jews. Thanks for taking time to talk. Thanks for having me. So it's not a fun thing to talk about, um, the rise of Jew hatred, the rise of anti-Semitism. Um, it's always been there, but something since post-October uh, 7th, since this atrocity uh, in Israel from by, by Hamas, um, it seems like it's just through the roof everywhere. And I wonder, what do you think is going on? Like, where is this coming from? I mean, I think this was really kind of a masks off moment for a lot of people because, you know, what, what's been really shocking and disturbing, as you know, for the Jewish community is not not so much, you know, response to, you know, the war in Gaza, but that this happened like, you know, right after October 7th was, you know, this sort of delight and joy that we saw from so many people who are celebrating what was the largest slaughter of Jews since the Holocaust. I mean, and I think that that was a really revelatory moment for a lot of people to sort of see, wow, um, that that this was not a moment that gave any a lot of people pause and that this, in fact, was something that a lot of people were celebrating. And that was really, really disturbing. Yeah. So one of the places that people have been surprised by is uh, American campus life. Uh, we think of that as a safe place. Many people think of that as a safe place for students. Mm -hmm. We think of faculty as some of the most en more enlightened people, you know, and we see um, the rise of anti-Semitism on campuses, not only from students, but from faculty as well. Even prominent places where where you studied, and I once studied to study as well as, as, as Harvard. Um, and I know you've been in, engaged with that. And so can you share a little bit about what you think is happening on campuses and is this something to be alarmed about or is this a minor thing? And and in particular, what's been your experience with Harvard? Sure. So, um, yes, I was serving on uh, the former Harvard president's uh, anti-Semitism advisory committee. Um, I was asked to participate in that. Um, I don't work at Harvard, to be clear. I was you know, asked to participate really just as an alum who had written and, uh, about this topic. It was a national voice on this topic. And what I found really disturbing about that experience is that you know, I think a lot of the stuff that's been going on in co college campuses has been portrayed in the media as sort of a, you know, a debate about free speech or about, you know, what are the limits of criticism of Israel or questions about diversity, you know, diversity, free speech, criticism of Israel, wherever you are on the political spectrum. And people were sort of using it as the kind of political football. And what I discovered in sort of this, you know, front row seat to this, because, you know, once it became public that I was on this committee, students started coming to me with their horror stories, um, you know, certainly students at Harvard and, and other places also. Um, and what became really, really clear um, is that the problem wasn't that student, that Jewish student, or wasn't, isn't, the problem isn't that Jewish students on college campuses don't want to hear criticism of Israel. The problem was that Jewish students on college campuses don't want their dorm rooms vandalized. They don't want people urinating on the Hillel building. They don't want to be punched in the face for being Jewish. They don't want to be beaten with a stick for being Jewish. They don't want being, to be threatened with death for being Jewish. They don't want their professors spewing anti-Semitic lies in class. They don't want to be thrown out of a class for being Israeli. I mean, these are all, all of this has happened on American college campuses and more. And I mean, it really is... You know, there's this sort of mythology in the public perception of this. That this is all about, oh, it's about, you know, people want to shut down free speech or, oh, they don't like the slogan or something irrelevant. The issue is harassment of Jewish students. And I mean, that is something that, you know, is, and, you know, are there Jewish college students who are having not experiencing this? Yeah. Hmm. Um, what I found is that the students who are most likely to be experiencing this were the students who were basically couldn't avoid their Jewish identities. So students who are either, you know, religious um, or students who are Israeli um, were the ones who tended to experience this the most because um, they couldn't hide from it. Whereas other students, I think, had the option of sort of when hearing these things would be able to sort of just not say anything and sit back. Whereas um, the students who weren't able to hide so well are experiencing really rampant harassment in a lot of places. So that's that was what was really disturbing to me. Connected to campus policies and looking at the corporate world as well. I mean, how how what, what is the de, the the, the uh, many people talk about DEI these days. What's the, what's the DEI relationship to anti-Semitism by and large? Well, so I'm you know not going to speak for any you know one school or or institution obviously, but I think that 
you know, there and there certainly has been a blind spot about anti-Semitism in a lot of these sort of diversity and inclusion initiatives. And one, um, I the way that I have understood it is that you know there's, you know, anti-Semitism isn't th those structures are set up to combat social prejudice. So social prejudice is you know when you know a majority sees a minority group and thinks, oh, these people are inferior to me, and that's you know we're combating that bigotry. Um, which is really important, obviously. Um, the problem is that anti-Semitism isn't really a social prejudice. It's a conspiracy theory. Mm -hmm. And a conspiracy theory is the opposite of a social prejudice in that a, in, a, in a conspiracy theory, you actually think these people are superior to you, right? You think that there's this, you know, they're this, uh, they're the evil supervillains who are manipulating everything behind the scenes. And so unfortunately, it's like, you know, if your worldview is that, you know, there's people in our society who have too much power, too much privilege, and are overrepresented. And you know, our goal is to le level the playing field. I mean, there's a there's merit to that worldview. Mm -hmm. But if that's your worldview, you're going to fall face first into anti-Semitism mm -hmm. because that is the core anti-Semitic conspiracy theory since ancient times is that Jews have too much power and Jews have too much privilege and Jews are overrepresented. Mm -hmm. You know, and the reality is, you know, Jews are overrepresented in a lot of aspects of American life, including among college graduates and, and people in academia. But, you know, the reality is uh, there's no sector of American life that's like a cross section of America. I mean, you know, people, all, all different groups are represented in various ways in different parts of American life for lots of reasons. The example I love to give is that you know, Mormons are overrepresented at the CIA. Mm -hmm. Does anyone think that Mormons are, you know, nefariously manipulating foreign policy like no it's like you know that there's you know because no one's been marinating in a anti you know mormon conspiracy theory that's been going on for thousands of years so you know it's like this sort of a, there's this baseline assumption in a lot of western societies that people have like it's unconscious that basically the assumption is that you know jews are the obstacle to mm -hmm whatever our ideals are, right? Is that there's this assumption that the presumption that Jews are collectively evil and people don't even realize that they're operating on that assumption. And that's to me been sort of, sort of really disturbing in this sort of masks off moment. Mm -hmm. Wow, wow. Okay, so a last question for you. And I know it's a loaded one with a lot of historical context. But... Not like your other questions. They're totally not loaded <laughs> right. at all. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so uh, you know, so I don't happen. hate Jews. I just hate Israel, and I and I think Zionism itself is racist and and illegitimate. I'm anti-Zionist, but I love Jews, right? Can you share a little bit about the history of this relationship between anti-Zionism and anti-Semitism? Well, so I mean, there's a lot to be said about this. Um, but you know, often when people ask this question, you know, can't I be anti-Semitic, anti-Zionist without being anti-Semitic? You know, I often will say, you know, I don't know if you're aware of the origins of the slogan you just shared with everyone. It's from the Bolsheviks in 1918. Um, this was, you know, in the early years of the Soviet Union, there was a, the, you know, Communist Party was trying to, you know, get Jews on their side in this, you know, while waging civil war in what used to be the Russian Empire. And their slogan in 1918 for the Jewish sections of the Communist Party was, we're not anti-Semitic, we're just anti-Zionist. This is 30 years before the creation of the state of Israel. It's probably not about Netanyahu, um, you know, and, you know, in the process of not being anti-Semitic and just being anti-Zionist, they managed to persecute, torture, imprison, and murder tens of thousands of Jews. You know, later the Soviet Union starts this um, campaign that they, of spreading this, um, you know, oh, we're just anti-Zionist slogans to their, um, their client states in the developing world, to progressive circles here in North America. And, you know, this is there's a thick uh, paper trail from this from the KGB of how they sort of were rebranding anti-Semitism as anti-Zionism, that this was the acceptable way for progressives to be anti-Semitic. And what you see is this, um, I mean, and this is how you have like literally Harvard faculty posting a cartoon, an anti-Semitic cartoon that is straight out of KGB propaganda on Instagram like three weeks ago. And so, you know, this you know, this idea of, you know, oh, we're not anti-Semitic, we're just anti-Zionist. It's like, there's this, again, that assumption of nefariousness. I mean, what you see is the story of the 20th century is the, you know, is the end of empires and the rise of nation states. And, you know, this is the beginning. So, you know, Zionism is, you know, in terms of, you know, Jewish attachment to the land of Israel. I mean, there's no aspect of Jewish traditional life that isn't connected to the land of Israel. I mean, this is the whole, the whole civilization is based on this. Every holiday is based on this. Um, but, 
uh, Zionism as, as a modern Zionism as a modern political movement to um you know for Jewish self determination in in Israel in the land of Israel where you know, where Jewish civilization is is native. You know, this arises in the same period, in the early, late 19th, early 20th century, as all of these other national movements around the world that are all sort of responding to the, the dissolving of empires, right? I mean, it's the end of the Habsburg Empire, end of Ottoman Empire, British, French, Japanese. This is happening around the world. Um, you know, you have the beginning of the Zionist movement at the same time that you have the beginning of the Arab national movement, right? Actually, and both of them had their national first national congresses in Europe. Right. The first national Zionist National Congress was in Europe. The first Arab National Congress was in Europe in 1913. And then you have, you know, the, the splitting up of these empires into nation states. Every time that happens, you have violent displacements of populations. So, of course, the creation of the state of Israel, five armies invade. There's a violent, in many cases, violent displacement of most Arabs who were living in what was then the Arab state, what became the Jewish state, excuse me. You then have the violent displacement of virtually all Jews from what became Arab states. And, you know, this is typical. This is the story of the national of, of the story of the 20th century. You see it with the uh, the Ottomans, with the Greeks and the Turks. You see it with the partition of India. You see it with the division of Korea. You see it like all in all of Africa. I mean, this is like this is a story of the 20th century. Um, I mean, it's only in the case of Zionism where this is considered some sort of nefarious aberration of world history. The reality is that Zionism is typical 20th century national movement. And, you know, the reality is also talking about Zionism now. Is honestly kind of irrelevant because you know Zionism was the purpose of achieving this you know Jewish self determination. That's been achieved. It's existed for seventy five years. So I mean, I don't think there's any other state in the world that we're talking about undoing the existence of a sovereign nation, right? I mean, we don't even try to do that for states that are you know dictatorships that are doing horrible things to their own citizens. No one's saying that those states should be dismantled. Mm -hmm. And so this is really, it's this idea that Jews are some sort of exception to human. Human life is again coming from this unspoken and often unexplored assumptions that Jews are evil, and that's sort of that assumption is this deep groove in Western civilization. Fascinating stuff. Um, for, uh, I, I I'd love to talk with you longer, but I think we should pause there. And I wish you just lots of blessings and continued success in your teaching and writing. And friends, if you just Google Dr. Dara Horn's name, you'll find many relevant, fascinating um, articles in recent years. And you should certainly check out People Love Dead Hughes if you haven't read that yet. Thank, Thank you. you very much. Thanks for having me.